May we be of some assistance, Inspector Smythe? General Farmsworth Armstead, one of the six surviving Waterloo Tontine ticket holders, has been murdered. Waterloo Tontine? The Waterloo Tontine was a lottery of sorts, Watson. It was set up in 1815 to aid the veterans of the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington's victory over Napoleon. Yes, of course. I knew that. Quite an ingenious plan on the part of the founders. One pound bought a ticket in the name of some young relative. The ticket proceeds amounted to over a million pounds. Half went immediately to veterans and their families for medical and hardship expenses. What became of the other half? It all went into an account at the Bank of England, where it's been collecting interest all these years. Very clever. And how does one win this prize? Simply by outliving all the other ticket holders. Mm, and now you say one of them has been murdered. Very suspicious. Who are the remaining five? The oldest is Captain Robert Jurgens, age 82. Then there are Nita and Claire Thomas, who are 80-year-old twins. William Rowland is 79, and Peter Dudley is 77. Poor General Armstead was the youngest at 74. Seems as if he would have had the best chance to outlive the others. I recall reading something in the Times about a big to-do involving the Tontine survivors on the 18th. That's correct. The Waterloo Anniversary Banquet at the Langham Hotel. Why is the name Armstead familiar? He was a noted art collector, I believe. He also authored a well-known book, Treasures of the Conquerors. Quite right. At the time of his death, General Armstead was working on a revised edition for his publisher, Norget and Company. It was to contain an entirely new chapter on a fabulous diamond called the Polar Star, which at one point belonged to Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. The general had new information which traced the gem to its present owner. Tell me about the circumstances of General Armstead's death. Oh, yes, of course. Well, let me see. At 10 o'clock this morning, the general's valet, David Sennett, admitted a caller to the general's study. Sennett says he did not know the man. He was elderly and spoke with a French accent. Sennett told him the general never saw anyone in the morning while he was at work. The gentleman insisted that if Armstead read the letter he had with him, he would make an exception. And so it was. Sennett took the letter in, Armstead read it, and went quite pale. He told Senate to let the gentleman in. Sensing something amiss, Senate dawdled in the area of the study for the next 15 minutes or so. Then he heard the distinct sound of sword play. He tried to enter the study, but found the door locked. Then he heard the crash of breaking glass. He raced to the kitchen and out the back door to enter the study from the garden. By the time he got there, the caller had vanished and the general was leaning heavily against a shattered display case of military miniatures. Before Senate could assist him, he dropped a saber from his hand and fell over dead. And I take it the letter which so upset the general was nowhere to be found. Correct, Mr. Holmes. Well, we shall put our brains and our feet to the task.
I found the general leaning over the display case. He had his saber in hand, the one that usually resides above the fireplace. Mm -hmm. I understand he was a collector of military figures. Yes, the display in the study shows the last great British charge that swept the French from Waterloo. Is there any significance to the fact that the figure of Napoleon is facing backward? How strange. Perhaps I should go and set it straight. No, don't touch it. Not until the police have concluded their investigation. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I also noticed the portrait over the display case. The late Mrs. Armstead. Do I detect a note of hostility? I must admit we did not get on very well. But I might say that Mrs. Armstead did not get on very well with anyone, including the general. You mean they didn't marry for love? Hardly. Lord Fitch, Mrs. Armstead's father, arranged the match. Her dowry was very generous. Lord Fitch would have paid any amount to ensure that he would not be left with a spinster daughter, especially such a nasty one. If there was no love lost between them, why did he keep her portrait in his study? Actually, it was put up there to needle Mrs. Arnstead's brother, the present Lord Fitch. He never approved of the marriage. Even after her death, they were involved with mutual business affairs. They jointly owned stock or some such thing. Tell me, do you know what the general was doing at the time the intruder arrived? Yes, he was working on the new section of his book, the part that concerns the gem, the polar star. It was very interesting, really. It traces the ownership of the gem to the brother of Napoleon, to the Russian Count Rostov. Unfortunately, the gem was stolen from the Count three years ago. As a matter of fact, the general just received a letter from a Pierre Montan who said that he was willing to divulge the name of the present owner of the gem for the agreed-upon fee. Do you know where Mr. Montan might be found? I believe he's staying at the Bridge House Hotel. Did the general have any encounters with anyone out of the ordinary in the past several days? Not really. An old friend of his has been in town, Jean-Paul Girard. Neither the general nor I have seen him in 40 years. In fact, they were going to meet this afternoon at the French embassy. I'm obviously curious about the general's last visitor. Could you describe him, please? He was an old man, a rather short fellow. He walked with a cane and carried a carpet bag. Did he give a name? No, no. He simply wanted to see the general, and he handed me a letter to take into him. Did you read it? No, no. It was in an envelope, rather yellowed with age, though I noticed it was addressed in a graceful hand to Captain Armstead, 12th Hussars, the general's old regiment. When the general read it, he went very pale. Then he asked me to admit the gentleman. Tell me, when you finally got into the room from the garden, were the study doors still locked? Yes. I noticed that there is an eight-foot fence surrounding the garden, and that the only way into the garden or out of it is through the kitchen door or the study. How terribly observant, Holmes. <laughs> I've rung the bell a half dozen times and no one has come to the door. Really, Watson? Next time I would appreciate it if you would thoroughly research your leads before you ask me to come along. But you must see Philippe perform. My nephew is an artist, a, a wonder. He manages to portray the Emperor Napoleon from age 19 until his last days on the island of Salonne. You would swear five different actors playing the part, but no, it is only Philippe aging before your eyes. At 48, he is the toast of the continent. You seem rather young to be the uncle of a 48-year-old man. I am but eight years older than Philippe, though I can assure you I am his uncle. You might say that our family has a history of late arrivals. 
Philippe's father was 25 years older than myself, and Philippe's poor sister was 15 years older than he. Why do you say poor? She died many years ago under tragic circumstances. In fact, her mother was so upset over her daughter's death that she was put into an asylum. We received word yesterday from the asylum that she had also passed away. It upset Philippe very much, resurrecting old ghosts, as you might say. But we have been playing for enthusiastic audiences for several weeks. As we say in the business, this show must go on. And Philippe is a trooper. He would never allow it to affect his performance. Can you tell us where Philippe Arnaud is this morning? We should like very much to meet him. Ah, well, he is not here now. Our company is staying at the Grand Hotel. However, I believe today he is visiting the National Gallery. But if you had come back this evening, I will have tickets awaiting, and after the show, you're welcome to come backstage and meet him. How fortunate that Inspector Lestrade authorized the hotel manager to allow us to search Philippe Arnaud's room. Perhaps we can return the favor and solve a case for him someday. Today, for example. Let's look around. How strange that a man who requires a cane would leave without it. Perhaps he doesn't require it for walking. Look here at the handle. Well, well that could certainly give a fellow a start. Precisely, Watson. Look here. It appears to be a letter. It looks quite old. It's addressed to Captain Armstead, 12th Hussars. Shall I read it? Please do. Dearest, how I hated you for leaving me, but the child, our child, eased my heartache and muted the hate. Now my sweet baby is dead. How cruel that the innocent must suffer for the sins of others. Now I have nothing. Now I am nothing. I cannot bear the pain. Goodbye, I love you still, Florette. How tragic. Why, perhaps this is the very letter that the general read. Good thinking, Watson. Farney and I spent over a year quartered together in France in war college. We became the best of friends. Did you know much of the general's personal life at the time? Ah, he always put the rest of us to shame in the matters of love. Said it was because we had no horse face to spur us on. Did the general have a passion for horses? Mon Dieu, no. He was engaged to a terribly unattractive woman by the name of Mary Fitch. Behind her back, that's what he called her. Horse face. How dreadful. Whatever became of her? She eventually became Mrs. Armstead and brought her great fortune to the marriage. I believe that Farney looked upon his stay in France as his last great fling. Are you saying that there was no particular woman at the time? I did not say that. There was one, but I never met her. My little flower, he called her. I remember one night he could not sleep. He was slightly drunk and he kept rambling on about promises that must be kept and promises that couldn't be. Finally, he collapsed on the bed with such sadness in his eyes, I will never forget it. Ma Florette, he said. How very touching. <clears throat> have you seen much of the general over the years? We have always maintained our friendship through correspondence, until last week, that is. It was the first time we had seen each other in over 40 years. We had supper, and then went to see the French actor Philippe Arnaud perform. The general commented that my presence beside him while French was being spoken reminded him of the old days. So your visit went well? Exceedingly well. Can you think of anything that might have been troubling him? No, the general was in excellent spirits. He joked about the upcoming Tontine celebration at the Langham, and he was very enthusiastic about the new information concerning the Polar Star. In fact, this week he was supposed to meet with a countryman of mine about it. It is hard to believe that my good friend is gone. Hear ye, 
hear ye. The Queen's Court now stands in order. I see we have the pleasure of your company, Mr. Holmes. I understand you've been investigating the murder of General Farnsworth Armstead. That's correct, my lord, and I believe I have solved the case. Do you now? Well then, tell me, who murdered the general? A brilliantly logical deduction, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, my lord. Now tell us, why was the general killed? Now, tell me, gentlemen, what was the general trying to say when he turned round the figure of Napoleon? Rather clever of the old boy, what? Indubitably. A man who keeps his wits about him to the last has my undying admiration. Hmm. I was wondering, uh, just for the record, could you tell us what the general used to call his wife? That is extraordinary sleuthing. Why, I do believe you may have matched Mr. Sherlock Holmes' solution. A remarkable feat indeed. Absolutely perfect. I'm quite sure we could not have done any better. You say you've come up with a solution, and yet you sit there calmly cleaning your meerschaum. Please, Holmes, tell me what you've uncovered. Of course, Watson. It's quite simple, really. The most intriguing fact about this murder was the method. Mr. Sennett's report that he heard the distinct sound of swordplay struck me as most odd. It suggested an affair of honour. At General Armstead's home, my suspicions were confirmed. The old letter addressed to Captain Armstead, a rank he'd held some 40 years ago, suggested that it must have concerned something from the past, something that was clearly upsetting to him. That was the reason for the duel. But how can you be so sure there was a duel? Simple reasoning, my dear Watson. The general had time to place his chair against the wall, climb upon it, and retrieve a sabre. The murderer allowed him to arm himself. A duel is the only event that fits with the facts. Are you sure the caller carried a sword? I thought all he had with him was a carpet bag and a cane. Perhaps it only appeared to be a cane. Ah, yes. The intruder was described as an old man, yet he left the premises over an eight-foot wall. Clearly he was in disguise and carried off the ruse with enough expertise to completely fool the general's manservant. The carpet bag must have been used as the receptacle of the disguise when it was no longer needed. Positively clever of you, Holmes. But what made you think it was Arnaud? Well, since we were looking for someone adept at the art of disguise, Girard's mention of the actor Philippe Arnaud struck a chord. Also, Arnaud plays Napoleon. No small coincidence. What are you getting at, Holmes? When the general turned round at the figure of Napoleon, he was trying to tell us that his murderer was Napoleon. Or rather, the actor playing Napoleon, Philippe Arnaud. So Arnaud killed the general to avenge his long-dead sister's honor. Ah, well, unlike most of our cases, this motive was closer to the heart than to the pocketbook. Quite so, Watson. When Arnaud's sister Florette was an impressionable young girl, she fell madly in love with the dashing English captain. When he left, she took her own life. So pathetic. Wait, there's more. Florette's grief-stricken mother went mad and was sent into an asylum. Thus, in the twinkling of an eye, little Philippe Arnaud, who was but a child himself, lost both his mother and his sister. It's so sad. I'm sure he was too young to understand the circumstances that caused it. Yes, but four decades later it all became clear when he found a letter written by his sister. It yielded an explanation and a name. Armstead. He came to London armed with that letter, and a sword came. But he was here for several weeks before he did the deed. Yes, and he might not have done it at all had it not been for the news of his mother's death. That was the final blow. He went straight away to the general's home to take his revenge. Voila. Positively brilliant, Holmes. How do you do it? With this pipe cleaner, of course. Do you people have nothing better to do with your time than to interfere in police matters? Well, don't bother with this one. We have the matter under control. I've compiled a list of suspects, which you may not see. I intend to ask each one for an alibi, and the suspect unable to supply one is our killer. 
Quite scientific, really. Now, off with you. Ellis, my good man, what can you tell us about the Tom Teen story? Time does take its toll, doesn't it? Back in 1865, the Times sponsored a 50th anniversary banquet. I'm quite sure I wasn't out of my pram, but I understand there were 204 survivors at the time. Now there are only six, pardon me, five, now that the poor general has been skewered. General Armstead. Believe I know that name in connection with the Polar Star Diamond. Believe it was once owned by the Russian Count Rostov, some rich old duffer. Towards the end of 87, somebody pinched it. Do you happen to know who? Nobody knows for certain, mind you. But the word on the street was the thief was a Frenchie by the name of Andre Martin. Had quite a reputation as a jewel thief, he did. Though his reputation was based mostly on rumor. Just before the Polar Star was lifted, he had been seen in St. Petersburg. A few months later, his body was found floating in the Thames. Drowned? No. He had been strangled. The crime was never solved, and the diamond was never found. The librarian was kind enough to write down all the information. Evidently, Tontine comes from the name of Lorenzo Tonti, the Neapolitan banker who introduced the system into France in the 17th century. The Battle of Waterloo took place on June 18, 1815. It is so named because it took place near the town of Waterloo in Belgium. The combined British and Prussian forces routed Napoleon's army, proved to be his final and worst defeat. Dear Watson, whatever would I do without you? Heaven only knows, Holmes. Can you tell us what did him in, Sir Jasper? A sword through the heart, a smart upward thrust. I'm here regarding the Armstead case. I take it this is the sabre he had in his hand at the time of his death? Aye, indeed it is. A lovely thing to behold, isn't it? Unfortunately, it yielded very little evidence. Uh, the top half had traces of dust all along it, indicating it had been unused for quite some time. I did notice on the point a tiny amount of fresh blood. Uh, the general must have scratched his opponent. I'm sorry, Whitson. That's all the information to be gathered from this beautiful masterpiece. Unga! That's Watson, sir. Watson. The good general married into a considerable fortune when he took Lord Finch's spinster daughter, Mary, off his hands. Mary's brother, the present Lord Finch, was opposed to the marriage from the very beginning, and there was still considerable friction between him and the general. But through holdings which the general inherited from Mary, he and his former brother-in-law were in business together. Ah, the ironies of life, eh? Why do you think Malcolm Finch was so opposed to the marriage? Well, I'm not sure, but it had something to do with the general's reputation with the ladies. Of course, this was before my time. Now, I'm not certain he can be of any help to you, but you might want to check with my illustrious predecessor, Mr. Lloyd Shoemaker. I'll make a note of that. You know, of course, the general wrote a book about art collectors and included some less than chivalrous details about how a few of them had come by their collections. One man, Carson Cabot, a gem collector, was quite incensed by being so named. In fact, he accosted Armstead and fractured the general's collarbone. I understand that the general was going to include a chapter on the Polar Star Diamond in his revised book. Would you happen to know if Cabot had anything to do with that particular gem? Well, I can't be certain, but being the collector he is, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't already have it in his possession.
bloody shame it was about General Armistead's death. How touching, Shinwell. You're really grieved to see him pass on. Well, sure, I had me money on him. I should have trusted me instincts and gone with one of the ladies. Captain Jurgens doesn't seem to have had much of a following, even at 25 to 1. Nah, that's just Booth Lacey and his cronies, and that's really a sentimental bet. You see, Jurgens is Lacey's uncle. Captain, did you know General Armstead? Armpit, you say? Uh, Stead. Armstead. Oh, Armstead. I knew that bloke. A jolly good fellow. Uh, sat next to me at the last shindig back in 65. The 50th anniversary and all that rot. Uh, we had a grand old time <laughs> swapping lies about her adventures on foreign shores. Ah, oh, he swore by French damsels, but I argue for the China ladies. I hope they catch the Democrat who killed him and hang him proper. Have you seen the general since the 1865 banquet? I've never seen the general with a blanket. No, no, since the banquet. Oh. No. May I ask... What are your plans for the Tontine money, should you win it? Spend as much of it as I can while I'm still alive and kicking. Leave the rest of it to the Seaman's Fund when I'm dead. Or some people think I should leave it to my only kin, uh, my nephew, Booth Lacey. I never would, mind you. He's a bit of a laggard. He's never done an honest day's work in his life. Could I outlast the others and be found the next day with my skull bashed in? Look to Booth. He's sure to be holding a club in his hand. Would you care for some tea? Thank you, no. It's really quite good. We were just going to have some ourselves. I really won't be staying long. We get visitors so seldom. Did you know the general? We suppose he was at the last anniversary... Banquet. But we don't believe we ever... Met him. We were so sorry to hear of... His death. It is such a pity. Well, so, I imagine you ladies have thought about what you'd do if you won the Tontine money. We have no living relatives, so there's no one Would to... share it with, should we win? We need very little to... Get by on. Undoubtedly, we would leave it to... The Ladies' League for the Preservation of Finches. I'm terribly sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr. Holmes. I was finishing up my work. What sort of work? Wentworth is a poet. He works every day at his art from ten until one in the afternoon. Never misses a day. Never? If the world were to end at noon, Wentworth would not know about it until one. <laughs> now, what can I do for you, Mr. Holmes? Did you know General Armstead? Yes, I believe he is one of the Tontine ticket holders, is he not? Yes, he was. He was murdered this morning. How ghastly. Depending on your point of view. It does put your father-in-law that much closer to winning. What a demonic thought, wouldn't you say? To rejoice in the untimely death of another for one's own gain? Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Now, what can I be doing for you, Governor? I'm working with Sherlock Holmes. We're looking into the unfortunate death of General Farmsworth Armstead. Oh, of course. I I've just come off a job I had. My apologies for not looking me usual spit polish self. Oh, don't bother. I hardly noticed. Make yourself at home. 
I wish the missus were here to offer up some tea. That's quite all right. I won't keep you long. Heard about the general. Didn't know him, of course. Had no cause to wish him harm. Tontina, no. But I've got to look at it philosophical-like. I'm the youngest now. So it's all got the best chance of lasting the longest. Langdale Pike told us you might be able to help us. And how is Langdale these days? Has he lost his job? Or perhaps you're here to tell me that he's succumbing to some rare disease. Oh, heavens no. You'll be happy to know he's in the very pink of health. Oh, I'm sure you have no idea how that makes me feel. Mr. Shoemaker, the reason we're here is to ask about General Farnsworth Armstead and the circumstances of his marriage to Mary Fitch. Have you any recollections that might help us? Ah, uh, Miss Mary Fitch. As I remember it, Lord Fitch was in a dither to marry off his daughter. Uh, auction off might be more appropriate, actually. And Armstead was the highest bidder? Suffice it to say that despite a reputation as a randy dandy, uh, Armstead's career prospects were bright, and that seemed to be enough of a recommendation for Lord Fitch. The girl's brother was very much against the match and did everything he could to break it up. Soon after the engagement was announced, Armstead went on a tour of duty in France, where he had an affair with a young French girl. She became pregnant with his child. How positively scandalous. I admit I strongly disliked Armstead. He was a cad who made my sister's life miserable. I argued at length with my father against the marriage, but to no avail. But what was your sister's opinion at the time? Well, unfortunately, Mary was not the attractive sort who had scores of suitors. My father was afraid she'd be left to spinster. The engagement was arranged just before Armstead went to France. During the year he was gone, I had him watched and discovered he was in the thick of some scandal involving a young French girl. And you told your father? Well, he wouldn't listen. I even went so far as to give the story to the newspapers. But my father got wind of it and used his influence to prevent its publication. I would have done anything to keep my sister away from that man. Including murder? Why, why that's preposterous. Well, surely you don't think... I was scheduled to meet with Armstead today. But you see, my wife took ill. I spent the whole morning attending to her here until Dr. Ainstree arrived at around 11 o'clock. What did you discover, Watson? He wasn't in, Holmes. Though his landlady suggested we might try the Red Bull Inn. The woman practically talked my ear off, went on and on about how Lacey constantly plays up to his uncle, Captain Jurgens, who's one of those old gents with a ticket in the tontine. I thought she'd never hush up. I was wondering if you'd seen a Mr. Booth Lacey around here today. No. Nope. Must be my lucky day. Well, then, if it's your lucky day, why not spread some good cheer in the form of a pint and some food to that unfortunate chap standing outside your door? Poor bloke is missing an arm and a leg. That poor bloke's your one and only Booth Lacey. Well, the whole thing's an act. He's as normal as you and me. Spends half his time begging out front and the other half swindling folks down at London Bridge Station. Mr. Lacey, I see you still make your living by strapping your arms and legs behind you and fooling the poor public out of its tuppence. Man's got to make a living somehow. What can I do for you, Holmes? I want to ask you about the murder of General Armstead. General who? Really, Lacey. Perhaps you can fool some of the public some of the time, but you can never fool Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that General Armstead. Where were you at 10 o'clock this morning? Where else would I be? I was at church. You, Lacey, at church. It hardly seems like. 
I swear, at St. Mary's, they pass out soup and bread every morning at 9.30. The father will vouch for me, you can even ask him. I may just do precisely that. I was wondering, Father, if you happen to know a man by the name of Booth Lacey. I should say that I do. I see him every morning. At Vespers? Wish that it were. No, at our soup kitchen. We can pray for the unfortunates of this world, certainly. But we can also offer them a little sustenance of a more nourishing kind. Every morning at 9.30, our doors are thrown open to those less privileged than ourselves. And every morning, without fail, Booth Lacey is here. You're certain of that? I am. You see, with only one arm, he needs someone to carry his bowl to the table. Invariably, I am that someone. Can I help you, Mr. Holmes? Mr. Cabot, I'm looking for the murderer of General Farnsworth Armstead. Where were you this morning? You don't beat around the bush, do you? Not if I can avoid it. Well, it so happens I've been at home all morning. Yes, I can see that. Well, of course you can. You can? Either you've been at home all morning, or there's some other good reason why you are still attired in your bedroom slippers. How in the world did you hear about it so soon, Mr. Holmes? The body's still warm. Couldn't have happened more than ten minutes ago. Body? What body? Well, the one what's upstairs in 203. Oh, we're here for something else, actually. Looking for Pierre Martin. Well, that's the very fellow what was done in. Well, tell me, young man, do you know what transpired? Well, Mr. Martin checked into the hotel on the 8th. He was a Frenchman. I, I didn't speak to him much. Who discovered the body? I did. Well, I came along to his room to deliver a wire. Here it is, sir. Information still valuable. See me, Wells, Osborne, Norgate and Company Publishers. Tell me, did you see anyone suspicious hanging about? No. No, sir. Well, actually, now that I think about it, there was a rather large man with a foreign accent. Russian, I think. He said that he wasn't sure about the address and that he'd only just arrived in London. He asked for Mr. Matin and I sent him straight up. Well, he was rather well-spoken and well-mannered. I didn't think anything of it at the time. A few minutes later, he came down. He was practically running. I saw him go out the front door and hail a cab. Was there anything amiss in the room? Co I'll say. An inkwell was toppled on its side. Left an awful mess on the carpet. Big blue spots and inky footprints right the way to the door. The manager will be in a fret when he sees it. Fortunately, there was no blood. Perhaps he was strangled. Count Rostov, Watson. Count Rostov, Holmes? According to the woman at the embassy, he is the only Russian national who has arrived in London in the past few days. But how will we find him? He is staying at de Kaiser's Royal Hotel. However did you deduce that, Holmes? Elementary, my dear Watson. I asked. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, are you from the police? Were you expecting the police? I was. Um, my valet, Vladimir, reported to me that his interview with Pierre Martin was decidedly unproductive, as he was dead when Vladimir arrived. I see. Tell me, 
Why did he go to see Mateen in the first place? It was in reference to a certain valuable possession of mine that was stolen some years ago by Pierre's brother, André. I was in Paris and I read in the London Times that General Armstead was to revise his very interesting book to include a chapter concerning that possession. Originally, I came here to visit him. Then how did you discover Mateen's whereabouts? Shall we say, um... Someone made me aware that Mateen was also in London, that he was the general source of information. <laughs> but when the General Armstead was reported dead, I had no other alternative but to pay a call on Mateen. So I sent Vladimir, an old man's legs, you understand, to uh, speak with him. <laughs> General Armstead's book has been a very controversial subject from the start. I understand the original publication caused quite a stir among the public. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, you know, of course, that many of the treasures listed in the book had, in fact, been stolen by their present owners. <laughs> that revelation caused quite a sensation, and we were delighted. The more libel suits that were pressed against us, the more the book sold. May I ask why the General chose to revise an already successful book? There was one piece of critical information missing from the first edition. It was the whereabouts of a fabulous diamond called the Polar Star. Seems to be a very popular gem. Indeed. So you can imagine his excitement when last March he received a letter from a Frenchman by the name of Pierre Martin, who claimed to know where the diamond was. He had even provided a detailed description of how the gem was stolen from its last known owner, uh, a Russian fella, a Count Rostov. He said the thief was an Englishman. Might you know his name? Mm. Martin wouldn't tell unless we paid. As I understand, he was in town a day or so ago and had tried to set up a meeting with the general. Unfortunately, I don't believe they had a chance to meet. Been laid up for two weeks now with this blasted gout. Such a nuisance. Have to be carted about by my valet. Perhaps you should try avoiding those rich foods. Yeah, awfully sensible. But I always say might as well eat what you want now because who knows what they'll be serving upstairs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> quite so. <laughs> Mr. Rowland, did you know General Armstead? Not personally. I knew of him, of course. Our little group has become quite small. Terrible about his death. Me, I hope to die at the dinner table. <laughs> Provided that doesn't happen any time in the near future. Tell me, if you won the tontine, what would you do with all that money? Ah, uh, there's a question to titillate the imagination. I've played around with that one every day for the past 20 years. And? I'm still working on it. I understand that you have two sons in America and a daughter in London. That's right. My sons own a very lucrative import company and my daughter's married to a fine lad, Wentworth Cobbett. Though he is a bit of a starving poet. <laughs> <laughs>